afternoon. Thank you for joining the Dole Institute of Politics for the program this afternoon. My name is Irene Carcioni, and I am a member of the Institute's Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The SAB is a bipartisan group. As a member of the SAB, I get access to many great opportunities by being involved with the Institute's. If you are a KU student and are interested in joining, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu. For this afternoon's event, if you would like to know more about our guests, the event itself, and upcoming Institute events and more, you can download a printable program handout. The link is in the event description below. At the end of this afternoon's event, we will have time for you to ask questions of our guests. Please email your questions to dolequestions at ku.edu. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kurt King. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad to uh, join you this afternoon and be able to present this uh, lecture on uh, the Soviet military theory. Um, I uh, just by quick way of introduction, and I call it the 30 second promotional advertisement. Um, I, I work for uh, Army University Press at Fort Leavenworth, and uh, we are connected with the Department of Military History that does many of the Leavenworth lectures. And I just urge you to, uh, if you're interested in history at all, which if you're tuning in now, you probably are, uh, you can uh, Google Army University Press, and we have a lot of free publications and documentary films that you can download, and you might find that of interest. Um, so. Without further ado, though, I will start with my uh, my lecture. And as you can see by my front page and the title I have, I, I'm focusing on theory, which is the, the theme this year of, of the Leavenworth lectures. And I'm looking at Soviet military theory, I, but I don't want to have this as, as a kind of false advertising. I, I will certainly be delving into very theoretical concepts, so to speak. But I also find the people to be as much, if not more interesting than the theory itself. So you'll be seeing a lot of folks today and flashing their pictures up there because these are human beings too. Uh, like all other military people trying to develop theory, they, they are dealing with personality, rivalries, politics, uh, all kinds of things like that. And Tukhachevsky is a personal favorite of mine. I'll, I'll put that right up front. So, uh, but he is not necessarily the only focus, certainly, of this, of this uh, lecture. And the other picture, by the way, Operation Bagation, is uh, sometimes considered the epitome of Soviet operational art. It was in 1944, but as you'll see as I finish or go through the lecture, it was not practiced by Tukhachevsky or his band of theorists. They were purged, and it only it took years for the Soviet Union and the Red Army to recover. And those years included bad years fighting the Germans in 1941 and 42 for for a time. So, with that in mind, let's go ahead and start moving through my slideshow and get, get this thing going. First of all, I, I'm, I'm going to be describing a lot of concepts and theories, and I'm, I'm trying to do this for an inf informational. I'm not trying to argue necessarily a point of view, but there's a whole lot of controversy out there about which theorist was the best and what their ideas were. And hopefully, and, and I welcome questions at the end. There might be dis lots of disagreements with my thoughts on this, but if there is only most of this is informational. If there is one thing I kind of want to point out this in the next two slides, and that is what and who brought mobility back to warfare. And most popular historians, most of the general public that reads history, they tend to lean on the Germans going into World War II. And so they look at, you know, tanks. Uh, it was at the key, and the Germans were the masters of tank warfare. Uh, air power, the Stuka dive bomber, the classic example of that, which kind of extended your firepower deeper into the enemy's rear. Heinz Guderian, the German general, uh, is thought of as a great military theorist. And he actually is a, a very good thinker and a very good uh, executor of operations. But uh, he, you know, some people think he's the only one out there in the first one. And the example of great operational thinking and, uh, and operational penetration and mo mobility is the uh, is the France 1940 campaign known as Blitzkrieg? Uh, as many of you out there might know, Blitzkrieg is not a doctrine. It's not written into any German manuals. It is a phrase coined by journalists for the success of the invasion in 1940. So this is common thought of to, as to the uh, the origins of mobility going into World War II and, and operational maneuver. 
But I say, what about the Red Army? <laughs> and again, I will posit that I don't want to say, say they're superior, but let's just say I think they're forgotten and how far they got. And the main reason is the purge will cut short the great accomplishments that the Red Army had going into the uh, World War One, uh, World War Two. Excuse me. So what about the Red Army? Well, my friend Tukhachevsky comes up here, and of course the soldiers, the little picture there, their manuals, their doctrine, culminating in 1936 and their field manual there. And then it was demonstrated be, you know, before the full effect of the purges kind of wiped out some of these ideas uh, at Kalk and Gol, uh, battle that uh, was executed by uh, Georgi Zhukov using some of these deep operation theories and um, very successful in beating the Japanese. However, as I mentioned, a lot of this is lost going into World War II, but that doesn't remove the fact of the, the, the accomplishments of the theory and doctrine of the Red Army. Let me throw out a, a little outline here of what I'm going to go through. Uh, I'm going to go through some definitions because I don't know the group listening to me, how many of you have military backgrounds. It's really not that important, but uh, some of these definitions can be confusing even to the military professional. And Soviet uh, or uh, Soviet era and current Russian definitions are different than American quite often. Uh, so I'll talk about different terms and their definitions. Hopefully that one won't put you to sleep at the beginning here. Um, then I'm going to go through the czarist traditions, because the uh, the Red Army, although based on supporting a communist state, uh, did not come out of nowhere. It's uh, it has connections back to the czarist era. Uh, of course, then it's much influenced by Marx, Marx's theory. It's actually Friedrich Engels who's the uh, the pioneer in the military realm of Marx's theory more than Karl Marx himself. We'll look at World War I, the Civil War, and the Russo-Polish War, which all influenced uh, the Soviet military thought in the interwar years. And the picture there is of uh, Mikhail Funza, who is a, uh, one of the, one, a participant in those wars and later theorist. And another participant in those wars and a major player is our friend um, uh, Tukhachevsky. And then we'll look at the 1936 regulations, which is a culmination of all these debates and developments. Um, and then finally, the Purge, uh, led by uh, jo Joseph Stalin, Joseph Stalin, who, um, this is the military purge, which is 1937. Of course, he had been doing various purges before and after that, but obviously I'm focused on the military. So definitions. Well, first we have to understand the different levels of war. I hope it's not too repetitive for you folks out there, but normally we, folks uh, today, we think of uh, tactical, operational, strategic levels of war, and that's United States Army's concept also. So let's first look at the tactical level of war. Uh, what I don't want to do throughout this lecture is read um, some of these longer definitions or, or quotations to you. I'll let you read them. Uh, and typical teacher thing, I'll kind of count off in my mind as you do. And then I'll maybe emphasize a few points of that. So if you would, take a look at the tactical level of war. So you can see at the tactical level, we're talking about lower level units, smaller units, battalions, regiments, divisions, even a corps is considered kind of a tactical unit, especially in the Soviet system. Uh, the, uh, and we're talking about fighting battles, fighting tactical engagements or battles. Then to continue with our definitions, you have the operational level of war. Now notice I underline level because there's an operational level, which is just kind of a size question of units and, and, and frontages. But there's also an operational art, which is different, and I'll discuss later. So go ahead and please read that. So basically, we're talking about fronts and armies and somewhere between strategy and tactics. Now, maybe a few of you to say, what the heck's a front? Go ahead and put a little box around that. In uh, Soviet and even today's Russian terms, a front is an army group. Now, compared to the United States, or say their opponents in World War II Germany, their armies tended to be smaller, maybe two thirds the size of, of uh, uh, German or American army. And their fronts, which were army groups, tend to be about two thirds the size also, a little bit smaller, but there's, it still works to think of that as an army group for sure. And put in a picture here, this is, um, Let's see, third from the right, as I'm looking at, <laughs> is Marshal Vasilevsky in World War II with army commanders uh, and front commanders. He's actually coordinating two fronts uh, as he's in this particular uh, photo. 
Now, the strategic level of war, uh, you can read through that, but basically we're, we're talking the highest level. Uh, this is a political, economic, and military connection. And it, when you think about it, here's the big three in World War II, Stalin, uh, Roosevelt, and Churchill meeting with their political leaders, their foreign uh, uh, ministers, as well as their uh, military chiefs will meet with them. So that this is truly the highest level of war. And just a few more definitions. Here's operational art. Remember I said the art is something different than say a level of war. I'll let you go ahead and read that. And as you can see, it's tied to the operational level, obviously. But more than that, it's the commander's ability to skillfully employ the tactical engagements to reach the strategic goal, the ultimate goal of the of the nation. And uh, I, I quite frankly like the American definition. I'm used to that from my teaching, own teaching at Leavenworth. So here's the US definition. I'll read that one. A series of tactical actions conducted by combat forces coordinated in time and, oh, I misspelled that. Oh, no, it is right, place to achieve strategic and operational objectives in an operational area. So you have multiple tactical actions, some happening simultaneously, but some sequentially, and happening in various locations or different axes of advance. And you put them together, the good operational artist puts them together to achieve the ultimate victory in the strategic aim. So last but not least, a couple of particularly um, applicable terms to this this lecture that is deep battle uh, which the Red Army as it was theorizing in the 20s and 30s developed the concept for this and I'll let you read that now deep battle leans more towards tactics although it ties into some operational concepts but it's basically to defeat the enemy that is right in front of you not necessarily his reserves, but do that throughout the entire depth of their position. Okay, not just the very front crust, if you will. Whereas deep operations goes even further. I'll, I'll go ahead and read this, it's a shorter one. A simultaneous blow throughout the entire depth of the enemy's operational, rate, operational defense. And that's in order to defeat in detail, in other words, by peace, as the enemy commits their operational reserves and to destroy any enemy units that are still at the front. Perhaps you've encircled some at the front, and they need to be destroyed. And most importantly, continue the offensive into the defender's operational and strategic death. Have enough force and enough echelons, we'll talk about that later, but enough uh, planning more than anything else to be able to exploit the mere opening of a tactical uh, opening in the enemy's line. So now let's go to the next part after doing our definitions. Uh, we're talking about the, the uh, czarist traditions that influence how the uh, Red Army theorists will think in the 20s and 30s. And you've really got two, uh, there's many more czarist generals, famous ones, but two kind of the yin and yang of, uh, of, of Russian fighting in the czarist era. One is uh, Alexander Suvorov, um, whose main tenets were speed, offense, and surprise. And he was definitely the, you know, mobility, and uh, he's uh, quite a capable commander. He uh, defeated uh, Napoleon's forces on numerous occasions, if not necessarily Napoleon himself, but certainly his forces, as well as a lot of others, Turkish and so on. But Mikhail Kutusov is also an example of a Russian tradition, which is patience, <laughs> uh, you know, be patient, strategic depth, uh, the ability to retreat to take advantage of the distances in, Ma in Russia and draw your enemy in, and also to mass your resources. There's no need for Russia, which has a large manpower base, to try and win with small amounts of troops. They've got the resources, take advantage of them. So those are two kind of different ideas, of, and both of them are applied by the Russians in the Tsarist era. Now, the Marxists are going to influence, uh, Marxist theory is going to influence the theorists uh, in, in a bit, but I want to talk about Marx first, nicknamed uh, by some historians, I think even contemporaries, as the economist. 
we can kind of dismiss Marx from in terms of the military realm. He's not that much concerned with it. He is concerned about economics, class, other things like that. On the other hand, his uh, compatriot Friedrich Engels, um, while concerned with economics and class and all of those things, he's known as the general. He even wrote for a New York newspaper because he was fluent in English um, during the American Civil War. And he was in America and, and uh, was very interested in the developments of the American Civil War. So he's very interested in military events. However, between both of them, what you get is not that much that can help a modern conventional army. And when I say that, let me just start with what's there, the dialectic, um, which does influence how the theorists discuss the issues. But without getting too detailed, because this is the whole dialectic uh, from Hegel is can be complicated, but Basically, there's a thesis that someone will develop on a topic, and then you'll get the anti-thesis or antithesis, um, which is a kind of opposing or at least a differing view on, on that topic. And the two, they don't necessarily compromise, but they get you take the best aspects of both, and you come up with this new thesis. And basically, this opens, leaves the door open for debate, for ways of understanding diff difficult topics eat, uh, better and coming to better solutions. This would be applied to a degree in the army. However, you have to remember in the 20s and 30s, and then eventually with Stalin in the 30s and 40s, you're not gonna get much free discussion uh, as time goes on, but it, it is there. And you have historic materialism, which looks to place a scientific basis on practically every, uh, every aspect of study, if you will, every aspect of life for that matter. So it not only looks at classes and economics and all of those capitalism, so on, but it's they try to attempt to apply this to the military. It, it it does apply in certain areas, but there becomes a time it really is kind of in the 1950s and 60s more than earlier, where they become so possessed with the scientific nature that they start coming up with formulas uh, of how to uh, how to win a battle. Uh, you know how many troops are needed. Correlation of forces becomes one of their famous terms of how how many troops are needed versus the enemy. Uh, this is an influence on theorists, but not as bad or not as overwhelming, I should say, in the 20s and 30s. But the big issue is that Engels is focusing, along with Marx, on how to undermine the existing capitalist armies, not how to build one of their own. Um, it is only after they've seized power, well, they haven't seized power, but after the Bolsheviks seize power, they realize they have to turn their thoughts to creating, not destroying armies. Then you have Lenin come along, so you get Marxist-Leninist theories. And Lenin doesn't really contribute too much in terms of, you know, thinking of military doctrine. And his basis is that keeping in line with the Bolsheviks' view that there'll be party control and that the need to, uh, to win a war is the need to mobilize the nation, um, which again, is not all that fresh, but that, that his, that's one of his views. And then Trotsky is much more of an active player. He's the war commissar during uh, the uh, Russo-Polish War and the Russian Civil War. But he's much more of a practical uh, a player in the military. He turns to using czarist officers who had been expelled, uh, but he brings them back and uses a puts a political commissar with each one. But he needs their expertise, and he's willing to return to conventional doctrine with the czarist officer expertise to to win the Russian Civil War. So he's very practical, but he's not necessarily interested in creating new theories. Then let's go to the World War One experience. Uh, um, and I, I brought in the other ones first because the, the Marx and, uh, and then Lenin, they were they were just pure kind of a, uh, at a higher level. But in World War One, on the negative side, you had this inferior technology that the Russians had to put up with. Uh, against the Germans specifically, not necessarily against the Austro-Hungarians, who they, they did well. Uh, they were very clumsy in their tactics. There was little thought of an operational level or art. And unfortunately, they seemed to be possessed with a bounty of uh, weak leaders. There were some good ones, but there are an awful lot of weak leaders uh, in World War I. And on the positive side was one of their best leaders, uh, Bruce Silov. Uh, the, the right hand, you see a map of his offensive in 1916. And Brusilov had some very good ideas that uh, will work their way into the experience of the, of the uh, Soviets as they develop their theories. And you see there deception and surprise and careful planning. He believed in a broad front attack. And there's, that's something we're gonna talk about that has a lot of 
um, different nuances to it. It's not just attack everywhere at once. But uh, the, uh, he believed in that so that the enemy didn't quickly uh, grasp where your main thrust was. Problem, though, is, again, there's not much operational depth to his planning. His, his offensive was good at breaking the initial line and making some significant advances, but the follow-up is, is uh, just not there. And then we can look at the influence of the Russian Civil War. Uh, a lot more mobility. They're advancing hundreds of miles uh, at, at a time with a lot of deep raids, especially by the cavalry. And it seems like both sides don't have much difficulty making a, an opening in the enemy line. Now, of course, this is a bit, uh, a bit of an illusion because in the Russian Civil War, the troop densities are so thin, the front lines are so thin, and it's easier to break through. A lot of this is epitomized by uh, Simeon Budioni's 1st Cavalry Army. And that picture shows a bunch of their soldiers, which was able to break through the white lines quite frequently and move deep into the, the enemy rear. So there's, the, it, there's an appearance, at least, of operational thought, but it's really not well thought out. And then cavalry seems to dominate. And with that in mind, and with the picture I show, Unfortunately for Russian thinkers and planners, cavalry will continue to have too much influence on operations as they moved towards the 1930s and 40s. The Russo-Polish War, 1920 uh, and 21, which took place, uh, or 1919 and 20, and then a little bit in 21, um, that, that's really a follow-up almost immediately or part of the Russian Civil War, if you want to look at it. Uh, Tukhachevsky was a major commander. He was a front commander. I have a map here just to briefly show you. He made an, a large advance or an advance of great distances all the way from the border with Russia and, and Poland that had been kind of not worked out firmly yet. That's one of the reasons for the war. I'm going to highlight the red arrows. He approached Warsaw and passed to the north of Warsaw, consider, continuing deep into Poland. But it left him very vulnerable, and the Poles made counterattacks. You can see two green arrows in the north. That slowed down the northern advances, but the main counterattacks are in the south. And I'll highlight some green arrows. You'll see the initial advances, which kind of stopped Tukhachevsky cold, and then the follow-up and exploitation, which forced Tukhachevsky to retreat. He was able to get a good part of his army out or his front out of the trap, but also a lot were interned in East Prussia. But what he saw were great advances, but also the culmination of his advance and the ability of the enemy to counterattack and take advantage. So you see here great mobility and operational depth. depth. Um, the failure of permanent revolution, What the, this? I don't want to go to in too much detail, it was a Trotsky thought, but at a higher strategic level, the thought was workers in a, countries you were attacking would arise and uh, turn, their, uh, turn their, uh, against their governments and aid the advance of the Red Army as it kept moving. In other words, these other countries, especially Germany, if they could get to Germany, they wouldn't have to beat a German army because Germany would rise in support of the advancing Reds. This failed, and, and Tukhachevsky saw that and realized you really need to be able to conventionally support long advances. You just can't count on the enemy quitting or supplying you with their own stuff. And it also had the illusion of some easy tactical breakthroughs, which would not happen later. An unintended uh, result was Stalin. Uh, he commanded forces south of what you saw on the map, and uh, he uh, came to resent Tukhachevsky and his group of troops, the Western Front, and support the ones that were in his, in his area, except for one notable exception, Yegorov. So when it came to the purges, if you weren't a guy that worked with Stalin, you usually suffered the consequences. Let's look at the beginnings of these new theories. Uh, it kind of starts with a strategic framework, which will then develop into the operational thoughts and tactical too. So questions, long or short war? Should the Red Army be looking to be on the offense or defense? Is it gonna be a positional war like World War I? Maybe like a, tr a lot of trenches, attrition, uh, you know, long, a long war? Or is it gonna be mobile like the Russian Civil War and the Polish, Russo Polish War was? And will you need mass infantry armies like we saw in World War I, or is new technology enabling them or the armies who use small mechanized forces? And one of the new theorists was uh, Mikhail Frunze, I mentioned before. 
I've got these biographies here and uh, I'll let you uh, read through these because uh, I definitely don't want to read all the bullets and then I'll just emphasize the key thing about these biographies. I've got about five of these. So please go ahead and take a read of this. So what you have here is a person who's not a professional military man, not a former czarist officer. However, he took a great interest in military affairs, read, and he contributed a lot during the discussions. Uh, he died nine months after taking over the war commissar's job from Trotsky uh, when he went in for an operation and did not survive the operation for his heart. He wasn't having a heart attack. It was supposed to be some corrective operation. And uh, there's some thought out there because he was ordered for that operation by Stalin that maybe <laughs> it was on purpose, but there's not definitive evidence of that yet. Um, some of his theories, and you see the red uh, bullets played in here. Go ahead and take a look at that. Basically, again, he didn't have a, um, a military background or uh, with the old Tsarist army, and he believed that this unified military doctrine would be a very revolutionary, something completely new. But as you go to the last bullet, he eventually kind of turned and conceded that there was no unique proletarian military art, that uh, there might be some contribution there, but that you would have to go back to some of the traditional ideas of the military. And as you look to the future, debate on the merits of the military art itself, not necessarily its revolutionary content. And one of the other early theorists is uh, Alexander Stechen. Uh, he, as you see from there, I'll just briefly go through, but he is from a military family and has experience on the general staff and in the Russo-Japanese War. But he joins the Red Army in 1918 and serves with their main staff, which is kind of like a general staff in the Civil War. Uh, but after the war is mainly a scholar and works at the various military academies or instructs there. So he devotes much of his life to writing and scholarship and theory. And you can see, I'll let you read these bullets. One might say he was the more conservative of, of the theorists after uh, World War I, after the Civil War. Looked a little bit more towards the defense, although he didn't throw out the idea of using the offense, uh, and thought more in terms of World War I, positional war, long wars. And then finally, took a Chesky, and he is, although born to the landed gentry and has some military experience, although he was captured during World War I, as soon as he escaped prison, he, he joined the Bolsheviks and moved way up the ranks because of his competence, was an army and front commander, very successful in the Civil War. He did lose the Battle of Warsaw, but still did not lose favor until much later with the uh, Soviet leadership. And despite his background with the, quote, specialists or former czarist officers, he was a very strong party supporter. And he presented, represented kind of a... Uh, uh, not just a direct opposition, but a kind of a mirror image or opposite image of Svechin's concept of a long war. Now, at first, he oversimplified Svechin's view, probably just to you know make his case popular. Uh, but he said the USSR in the 1920s could not afford a protracted war. Uh, they didn't have the economic base for it. Um, they were not as strong as the capitalist countries. So maybe a, a mobile war was going to be what was needed and a decisive offensive. And he still clung to some of the aspects of revolutionary war that perhaps uh, that he didn't worry as much about the need for supplying his own advance. Uh, like I said, he hadn't quite grasped his own lessons from the Warsaw operation. So because of these views, various views, not just Vetchin and Tukhachevsky, but there are debates over the four main issues I talked about before, most of which are decided at the 1926 Military Congress. First, defense versus offense. And our friend Mikhail Frunze, well, he kind of argues both ways. <laughs> and I don't say this to diminish Frunze's uh, intellect or, or to say that he's uh, playing the, or by, or burning the candle at both ends or however you want to point this out. I think uh, he certainly intellectually saw the points of view of, of both men. 
and kind of looked and said, well, sometimes defense, sometimes offense. He, he was more specific than that, more detailed. Another uh, uh, person who's not so much of a, a player early on in the 20s, but I bring him up now because um, he does speak out about offensive defense, and that's uh, Shaposhnikov, and he will be the chief of uh, operations in World War II for the Red Army. But at this point, he's just a, a younger man in, uh, in a military academy, um, and he kind of goes for both aspects of this too. The final decision is that offensive warfare will take prominence. The Congress kind of says, yeah, defense is okay, but we're gonna, we're gonna lean towards developing offensive warfare in our theories. Now we're talking positional warfare versus uh, man maneuver or mobile, mobile warfare, excuse me. Uh, Svechin being the positional proponent and Tukhachevsky being the maneuver proponent. Frunza, many of you out there can probably guess, Yep, he kind of argues uh, either way. Again, he finds strength in both both ideas. The interesting thing is Tukhachevsky will modify his views. So he realizes, given the limitations of the Soviet Union in the 1920s, uh, their lack of economic development, we're going to do, when, they, when we go to war, we're probably going to have to be positional at first. Uh, that means, uh, you know, Trenches are going to dominate. It means maybe attrition, take advantage of our mass. Maybe later we can go to the maneuver or mobile warfare. So that's that's the uh, compromise there, if you will. And now, as we get to some other debates and different points of view, uh, another person is, and it's already been speaking his mind on these issues, but uh, Vladimir Triandafilov uh, is one of the great contributors and theorists during this time period. Uh, on your biography, I'll go ahead and let you read that. And what you see there is um, he, uh, born to an immigrant family, of course, he did have some junior officer training and served, but only up to the uh, rank of captain. So you're not talking about a guy who was like a general before the war. But once he had fought in the Russian Civil War and afterwards, he is uh, appointed to high positions on the Soviet general staff uh, before he died, um, unfortunately for him and, and the Soviet thinkers, the, uh, all too young in 1931. And here you see his, his view. He's on the side of mass armies in terms of this debate of mass versus mechanized armies. Um, that future wars are going to have high casualties, just like World War I. And once again, the USSR economy is not ready for that. On, on, a, on a different note, though, so he's not all one side. He's not all like on Svechin's side. He's very offensive minded. And later on, he's one of Tukhachevsky's great supporters, big supporters as the uh, debates continue on. The final decision is that there will be mass armies in the 1920s. They just aren't ready to make tank and mech infantry and uh, all these other uh, modern technological systems for mechanizing an armed force. But there are hints that that's in the future. Frunze writes about it, and he talks about in the future, meaning maybe the 30s, he's looking ahead. It's going to be a mechanized war. And Tukhachevsky's starting to abandon this idea that revolutionary spirit does it all. He says, without the necessary equipment, you cannot triumph in a future war. And he wants that equipment. He goes on to specify he wants to acquire that mechanized equipment uh, so that they can become that kind of army. Now, the strategic agreement, and, I, and then believe me, it's, it's, there's still debate, but after the 26th uh, Congress and, and some other meetings after that, uh, there's enough of a settled idea in the strategic realm that the operational art can develop. And that's where I'll go through a couple of folks here. By the way, the strategy is a mass army to fight an offensive war that will at least be initially positional. To support this, one of the earliest calls for the operational art comes from Svechin himself. Let me read this to you. The old division of military art into strategy and tactics is at the present time absurd. Operational art organizes the separate tactical activities into the operation. The tasks of grouping operations for achieving the war's political aim fall on strategy. So the, the, the operational art, uh, as in our earlier definitions, is kind of laid out here by Svechin. He's one of the first to call for it. And he gets early support from Tukhachevsky, 
from one of uh, his early written works, the Army Operation, the Work of Command and Field Directorate. That's when he was with the, the, uh, the directorate and he had a couple of other writers help him. This wasn't his sole work. But this talked about um, uh, the need for, uh, uh, to support Svetchen's idea of an operational art. And Trandafilov came along this, in this realm too. His, uh, the character of Operations of Modern Armies, the work that he did in 1929, uh, about two years before his death, is considered one of the, uh, um, as one of the authors I read said, a capstone uh, document for the development of operational uh, art in the Soviet Union. And then a new man comes along, Georgi uh, Iserson. Actually, he, uh, Iserson, he's actually been around for a while, or not a while, but before now. But he, he uh, will be a uh, acolyte of Trion de Fila. And I'll go ahead and let you read his biography. Here's a man with very little military experience, certainly not prior to the Civil War, and certainly not at high levels. But he was a great thinker. Um, and uh, he, he worked on staff, he worked in schools, and was highly respected, uh, even if he didn't command large forces in a major war. And here are some of his concepts, some more concepts we'll bring out later. Uh, as I mentioned, he supported Trian de Filov and, and thus indirectly uh, Tukhachevsky. He was a believer in broad front offensive, but attacks at multiple points in the broad front where there would be a concentration of efforts. There was also the need for depth, both at tactical and uh, operational levels. And this meant echeloning your forces. Now, echelons can be looked at two ways. You need to look at the enemy's echelons, his defensive layers, and where his reinforcements are. But he focused a lot on the uh, attacking Red Army echelons. When they went into the attack, what was going to be the initial advancing forces? What was the combination of their arms? Uh, when would the next echelon advance? What would its size be? How would it be equipped? And his solution was a use of shock armies, which were larger than your normal armies that were just for the defensive purposes, for the whole parts of the line. Uh, and they had enough, they had an extra artillery. Um, right now they don't really have tanks, but uh, they're looking more at cavalry, but they are supposed to be able to break through the entire depth of the tactical uh, line of the enemy. And then perhaps exploit, but it, that, those thoughts will be fleshed out later. So the operational art develops into some concepts. Um, there's three forms of army operations. And when you think about it, it makes sense that there, you attack either an enemy that's prepared, he's ready for you and, and set in a defense. You, the, you, the two of you are advancing at the same time, thus creating a meeting engagement, or the defense. You yourself can be on the defense. Then there's three forms of offensive maneuver. So between the, the against the prepared enemy and the meeting engagements, if you turn, you can turn a flank or turn two flanks. But that's probably only going to be done in a meeting engagement where you've not already deployed and established a set defensive line, which leaves you with a frontal attack if you're defending, or excuse me, if you're attacking a prepared enemy. But that frontal attack should achieve a penetration or multiple penetrations, which in a way creates an inner flank. In other words, you penetrate the enemy's line and you can turn left or right and take advantage of the open flank. So looking at the future, I've talked about Trian de Filov before, and in his famous book, The Character of Operations of Modern Armies, he talks about the use of shock armies. He, he divides them up and talks about their frontages and their composition. And he's taking into account the possibility of mechanization. And he talks about the wide front, but his view of a wide front is you penetrate and advance on multiple axes and they intersect, okay? And that's, this kind of creates your pe not just the penetrations, but encirclements. And even while that's occurring, further follow-on forces make penetrations in greater depth, the operational depth. And so Trandafilov is really looking ahead and is much respected uh, among the theorists at the time. And so now Tukhachevsky, uh, he comes, he, <laughs> I don't want to make it sound like he develops it, he um, it begins to adhere to some theories that others also develop, the idea of consecutive operations, not looking for the great one single blow. And he uh, writes this, uh, the, the direct quotations at the end, but the impossibility of destroying the enemy's forces in a single battle now compels the attacker to achieve this 
through a series of consecutive operations. So you're not gonna win it all at once. You're gonna to have to win tactical engagements consecutively over time. And he's supported by Svechin, Trandafilov, and a person I haven't mentioned yet, SS Kamenev, who was the commander in chief of the Red Army during the, the Civil War and Polish War. Not big in the theoretical sense, although he does write some theoretical works, but it's because of his experience is well respected, or at least uh, people will listen to him. And he definitely believes in second operations and supports Tokachevsky. Now there's, there is opposition out there to these theories, uh, not only between these theorists themselves, but from the old, old school, if you will. And uh, Clement uh, Voroshilov and uh, Semyon Budioni, uh, they are people that had served with Stalin. Uh, so we I talk about that you become a favorite if you, if you served with him. And I thought I really hadn't mentioned specifically, Stalin was the political commissar for the Southwestern Front in the Polish War. So he was a commissar at the time uh, working with all these generals. And uh, Voroshilov and Budioni, they're pretty resistant to any kind of change. They're not sure of this whole operational art uh, and level of war and all the, the idea of the exploiting to it in depth. And they just seem to never want to give up the idea of use of cavalry. Uh, Budioni had led the first cavalry army in the, in the uh, Civil War and the Polish War. But uh, for at least a time in 1934, they're the losers in the debate at various conferences and meetings, and then they will, uh, they're still in power. Uh, Voroshilov is the, uh, the, uh, the war commissar. He's in, in charge of all the military forces. Uh, Budioni is a district commander, uh, said to be a, set to be a front commander in the future uh, if the war occurs. So they're still in power, but their, their ideas of holding back the change are stopped for a brief time. Now, while all the debates going on, the Soviet, the United, excuse me, the Soviet Union industrializes. Who benefits from that? Well, their army, uh, the armed forces do, uh, certainly with airplanes and other craft, but the Red Army in particular uh, benefits. They can now look at mechanizing, which they had to postpone before. So let's see how the theory and the doctrine matures. You're still gonna have a mass army, uh, my little joke in their size matters. I mean, after all, you've got the troops, you can't mechanize everybody. So you're still gonna have a mass army. But now it's combined arms in, in many areas, not all, you're still gonna have some straight infantry units, but you will have an increase in your mechanized forces, larger ones, in fact, than most other armies going into World War II. The stress is again gonna be on the offense and your prob offense, you're probably gonna be looking against a prepared enemy. A couple of more points on these uh, theory and doctrine. The penetration on multiple axes that Trianda Filov had talked about, that really comes for the penetration of the tactical zone in depth, which is deep battle. We mentioned the definitions. And then taking the consecutive battles and some other ideas, deep operations, which is going even further, getting past the tactical zone. Where oh. is everybody? So the Provisional Field Manual of 1936 uh, is what codifies deep battle, which is your tactical action. Let me run through some of the points there. One, it's a major, a major combined arms effort. They definitely are stressing combined arms more so than any other army. And when the Germans later go to their mobility theories, they go to, ta uh, to tanks more heavily than anything else. And it's to achieve a simultaneous attack against the enemy's combat order throughout the entire depth of his position. Well, how does this flesh out? You still keep the three forms of army operations. It's a prepared enemy, media engagement, and defensive, although defensive doesn't get much play in the manual, it gets some. But to organize your forces for this, you have shock groups and holding groups at the tactical level. The echelons we talked about, the correlation of forces, how much you need to make a breakthrough and where the artillery support is. Tanks are, are discussed in depth, not only for infantry support, but your long range tags that will not only get you completely through the tactical zone, but will enable you to exploit the operational zone. And now of course, air power is being integrated into all of this. Now that's deep battle, which is codified in the 36 regulation, which is, I think I could get arguments, I'm sure for my audience is way ahead of other nations at the time. 
deep operations is a concept out there, but it's not been written into a manual at this time and not really well before the war. And Tukhachevsky is probably the leading proponent of deep operations, which goes even further than the tactical uh, penetration. A uh, col uh, colleague of Tukhachevsky said he was the Red Army's most outstanding military man, uh, according to or based on his strategic range of interest and his operational capabilities. And, and he might not have been the best pure thinker, but he really had a tremendous depth and breadth of knowledge. And he was also an actor. He can make things happen. An actor? Iserson supported his, or Iserson, excuse me, supported his views um, and emphasized the shock armies. This is for operational now. And, and the breakthrough echelons, which is some new concept, it wasn't written into any manuals, but the breakthrough echelons were, were uh, Iserson's idea, extend your advance further. Some people think this is the forerunner to what became after the war, World War II, operational maneuver groups that the Soviet Union developed. One thing they just could not solve was the problem of supply on deep operations. You would culminate, you'd run out of supplies, you couldn't bring your supplies forward fast enough, you couldn't build railroads fast enough, the trucks couldn't move over the destroyed ground if you had enough trucks. And so your operational reach, your ability to project combat power was limited. And it's still not really figured out into World War II until I think Operation Bagration is the best at doing that. But all, uh, I guess to use it flippantly, but all good things come to an end from the Red Army's point of view. Uh, Stalin's purge will remove most of these great thinkers, set the Red Army back, and in a, at least part lead to the early defeats of World War II. <laughs> Who does he get rid of? Well, this is a picture of the five first field marshals of the Soviet Union. Um, and they, uh, because at one point they didn't even have ranks, they were just called comrade commander, whatever unit you commanded. but our friend Tukhachevsky is killed in 1937, along with Bloiker and Yegorov. Uh, the the uh, Bloiker and Yegorov, we haven't mentioned much, if at all, as theorists, uh, but they were uh, both good commanders, both supported Tukhachevsky's concept. Who gets to live? Stalin's cronies, Budioni and Voroshilov. Others that are killed, Svechin is killed, well, Borovich, I haven't mentioned him, but he was a strong supporter of Tukhachevsky too. Uh, others are killed. Yakir, Kork, Eidman. Um, this basically beheads the far thinkier, thinkers of the Red Army. And that also brings my lecture part to an end. I, of course, ready to take questions. Um, I brought up the slide that shows how you can send the questions to the Dole Institute. And then I know you will, uh, I have it set up here that you will, uh, or I'm sorry, one of the students is going to send them to me by text. And I hope that the uh, I can work this system and uh, and answer all of your questions. <laughs> all right, looks like uh, I might be getting my first. It says, uh, Daniel asks, in World War II, the Russian T-34 tank was considered the best of its kind. Does the, does the Russia today have a similar weapon that is considered the best of its kind? <laughs> does Russia possess anti-tank weapons that can defeat the American Abrams? Um, it's a, a, a very good question. Uh, I have to admit some ignorance uh, in those in those areas, uh, particularly the anti-tank weapons. I'm not sure where they've gone. Uh, the, as you might know, the most popular anti-tank weapon was developed by the Russians, that, and it's used like in Iraq and Iran, uh, the um, the RPG, which cannot penetrate an Abrams. But I don't know if the uh, today's current Russia has developed it uh, as something better than the RPG. Uh, going back to the tank, yes, they have built a new tank, launched. Gosh, I can't remember about, about four or five years ago now. Is supposed to be equal to or superior to the Abrams. Uh, as a former armor officer myself, I don't know that. We, we thought um, the, the T-80 was going to be, you know, this great advanced tank. It turned out not to be so good. Uh, and then also the newer tank, the newest tank, still relies on a three-man crew, which I'm very skeptical of. It has an automatic loader, which sounds good on paper. But with a three-man crew, one problem is if uh, you can't afford to lose anybody in combat, it's almost impossible to operate that tank with two men. And a second thing is just simple things in between battle. It's great to do maintenance on a tank with four men rather than three. Uh, and uh, if it's, you know, sometimes I wish I had a fifth man and I had to work on my tank. So that, uh, that hopefully answers that question. Oh, my next question. 
not sure of the person asking, but how long did it take for the Soviet military leaders to be uh, recredited with the original Red Army Doctrine after it was watered down prior to World War II? Um, I, that's a really good question. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of looking at that in two ways, of course, within the Soviet Union itself. And uh, during the course of the war, and one of the things, too, that they went back and forth was with the power of the political commissar, whether he had to countersign orders and things like that. But uh, sticking back to your question, uh, it's within the Soviet Union, people like Tukhachevsky and so on, they're actually not rehabilitated till after the war, but their theories, their theories are rehabilitated uh, starting in 1942, more so in 43, and then 44, Operation Bagration is kind of the fruition of their, their theories being put into new manuals. But it does take post-war uh, um, to rehabilitate the people if that occurs. Uh, as far as uh, outside of the Soviet Union, uh, I, I think the German theories of warfare dominated the, the American, I can speak for the Americans more than any other army, of course, uh, their theories to a certain extent dominated because the Soviet Union was such a closed society and we were able to interview German generals after World War II. And I think it's not until the 70s that I start seeing books and, uh, and our own uh, um, a strategic studies institute, folks that studied Soviet Union for the army at Fort Leavenworth uh, began to reprint some of the original Red Army documents and get documents and give them credit for what they did. So uh, um, the, that's kind of the thought from our side. Let me uh, check this next one. Could, uh, could you talk about your background and how you initially became interested in Russian and Soviet military history? That's, I, I, I actually enjoy getting that question because uh, I, I tell that to a lot of friends um, because it's very convoluted. I will keep it brief though. Um, I was, uh, I grew up, you know, high school days and all that, very interested in military history, uh, but it was American Civil War. I read up on that first and visited a few battlefields and that was my, my first interest by far. And then I go to West Point, uh, cause I'm, you know, I'm reading about the American Civil War and who do I read about? Uh, Grant and, and Lee and Sherman. It's like, oh, they all went to West Point. That's, that must be an interesting place. I really wasn't fully aware of what it was, but I went there and, um, and when I, and I'm glad I did, of course, and became an officer, but as I'm going through the, the, our library, our beautiful library at West Point, and I'm looking at the American Civil War books, and I'm seeing hundreds of them, rows, stacked. And I say, can I really contribute anything to, <laughs> to the American Civil War? Of course, that's kind of naive. You can, there's still books being written with lots of new information. <laughs> but as I um, looked at that, I say, well, what is not written about? And at the time, it's the height of the Cold War. So as I, I looked at the, I went over to the uh, Russian side, and I looked up for books about the Russian Civil War, and I saw two about the war as a whole, not even about individual battles. I said, that's an open field. Um, I, I came, became to be more than just choosing it because of an opening. I came to really enjoy it. I, I was scared by the language, and I am very mediocre in my Russian language skills. But once I got into it, I, I really found it was interesting. And then later on, I served for uh, uh, my, my first two tours in the Army, went back to graduate school, and did it in... Russian and Soviet military history. Um, thanks for that, that question. I haven't seen a new one pop up yet. Oops, looks like I got one here. Uh, uh, Thomas, he asks, uh, what impact and influence did the deep operations doctrine have on post-war Civil War military thought, uh, a tremendous influence. The, the deep operations doctrine uh, it, it carried over after the war, probably not, uh, let me just say in the 50s, not as much, but in the 60s, and then into the 70s till the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, that's why I mentioned earlier, the operational maneuver groups were, were something that uh, was a direct tie or, or draw from the pre-war stuff. And uh, the idea of the penetrations, the echelons, all that stuff, even as equipment changed. One thing that began to influence Soviet military thought that not connected to things they had thought about in the 30s was not conventional war, but mil uh, nuclear. And uh, so that began to have an influence. It really didn't change much what the pre-war thoughts had been. But it is a powerful influence. I mean, to this day, the Russian military doctrine is very much, at least its conventional doctrine, very much tied to these earlier theories. Of course, now there's all the other things like cyber warfare, information operations, uh, all of those things that uh, are now integrated into Russian military doctrine. 
Uh, question I have here is, uh, although it's thought of as opposite in ideas and strategy, has the U.S. military theory been influenced in any way by Soviet or Russian doctrine? Uh, it, it definitely has. Uh, there, there's, there's no doubt to it. Um, I think, first and foremost, uh, the, the Americans' army, the U.S. Army, was not really crystallizing any thoughts about operational art for a long time prior to World War II and even after. And I think even though we relied on German thoughts more at a tactical level on how to make breakthroughs and uh, you know, use of tanks and all that, eventually we began to look at the Soviet idea of operational art and embrace parts of it. We, we definitely have our own. They're not opposites though. I'd say there's at least a 70% common ground between the two of them. That's a guess at a number. So there, there is a definite Soviet influence uh, on, on the way uh, we think about uh, warfare in general, particularly the operational art. Looks like that's about all the questions. Um, I, I'm gonna put up a slide that shows the next presentation and then I'll turn it back over to uh, the Dole Institute's folks who will also give a little bit of information. But the uh, next presentation from the uh, Leavenworth series, it may not be the next Dole presentation, um, is on 5th of August, and it'll be about Mahan and his theories of sea power. And so that's on the 5th of August, and there's the flyer for that. With that, that, that concludes my activities for my lecture, and I thank everyone for listening and the questions I got, and I'll turn it back over to the Dole Institute folks. Thank you for joining the Dole Institute of Politics for our program this afternoon. If you are a student and would like to join the Dole Institute Student Advisory Board, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu. Next month on Thursday, August 5th, we look forward to hosting John Kuhn for the next installment of our Fort Leavenworth series, Alfred Mahan Naval Theory. You can access this program on the Dole Institute's YouTube channel, just like today's program. Refer to the doleinstitute.org for up-to-date information on all of our upcoming programs. We hope you enjoyed this afternoon's program Thank you, and we will virtually see you next time.